Okay, we're back. It's only a few more days to Passover. We should talk about Passover. Passover with Rabbi uh, Itzhon Krasnjanski. And guess what, Rabbi? Today is Rabbi Schneerson's birthday. Am I right? Yes, you're right, Jay. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for having me on again. Yes, today is a very special day. It is the Rebbe's birthday. The, in the Hebrew calendar, the 11th day of the month of Nisan is the Rebbe's birthday. The Rebbe was born in 1902. And um, it is commemorated and celebrated throughout the world by many thousands and thousands of uh, Chabad uh, followers. Uh, as well as in the wider Jewish community. The Rebbe made a very, very huge contribution to the Jewish world and to the world at large. And uh, in fact, uh, in, 19, in the 1980s, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, the, both the House, the House and Senate passed a resolution calling uh, it Education Day USA to coincide with the Rebbe's birthday because the Rebbe was a very, very great advocate for education, and as a, uh, education as being the foundation of a moral society, not just education so that uh, one can learn a skill, and how to earn a living, but education and how to, you know, to form a mensch, mention, the Yiddish mention. word for... Being a good person. A good person, an upright good person with good morals and good values and, and um, someone whose uh, goals and aspirations are, um, are greater than oneself. So um, they um, instituted this day of edu U.S. Day of Education, Education Day USA, and every year they, they, uh, they re-sponsor it. And it's probably one of the few bipartisan uh, legislation. And even here in every single state, all 50 states in the US, the governors, including Hawaii, have, uh, have recognized this day in, in honor of the Rebbe as Education Day USA. I've, I've been to some of the Education Day programs in the, in the state capitol, for mm. example, yeah. So uh, Rabbi Schneerson was huge, larger than life, and he, even now, decades after he died. Um, he's, a, he's a leading light, at least for Chabad, and maybe others who are you know, in, the, in the Hasidic movement. But, but question, you know, will there be a successor? Will another rabbi um, ultimately step up and take that role? Uh, the answer is yes. And we, in the Jewish world, we call that person the Messiah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you're right, the Rebbe was a great, great uh, light and uh, perhaps the most important Jewish leader of our century, um, our generation. Uh, but it wasn't just for the Chabad followers. It was, the Rebbe was a, a, a leader of world Jewry because the Rebbe uh, uh, emphasized and perhaps the most important uh, revolutionary uh, idea that the Rebbe had was that we're all Jewish people, we're all one, and irrespective of our affiliation or uh, lack of affiliation or background, or we're all part of the Jewish people, and inherently we're all, we'll have a part of God within us, and we're all connected. And the Rebbe's message was not just to the Jewish people, but just to the, to the world at large, too, that, uh, you know, God, God uh, you know, endowed us with uh, the tools we need uh, to be able to live full lives and moral lives and lives that we can contribute to society. And um, there we would stress how education in the earliest ages uh, is really the, 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 the stepping stone and what makes it possible to develop into a functioning, positive. Did you, did you know him, Rabbi? <laughs> yes, uh, I grew up in the, in the area in Brooklyn where the Rebbe was. I was born in 1960. The Rebbe passed away in 1992. I would attend the Rebbe's uh, public talks, which was every Shabbos and Sabbath, as well as um, on the holidays for other occasions. And the Rebbe's talks were usually attended by um, thousands of people. And they were very, very uplifting and inspiring 
talks. And Rebbe actually inspired thousands of people to go out into the world, and to open Chabad houses, places where, uh, where Jews where can feel at home, irrespective of connection or not, and uh, partake in, of, of the, the teachings of Judaism and the message of Judaism. I know that's the message from Chabad. I, I actually knew that even before I met you. <laughs> even before I saw Chabad of Hawaii uh, you know, doing its uh, activities here. Um, I, uh, I, I ran into Chabad in New York City, and uh, it's always that same welcoming message. So speaking of which, uh, Passover is coming up, <clears throat> and you have a, a public Passover. Is that a fair way to say it? Yeah, we have uh, a public Can you talk pass about it? Yeah, sure. Well, I just want to conclude uh, in talking about the Rebbe. There was uh, a rabbi, there is a rabbi, he used to be the chief rabbi of uh, England. His name is Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sack. And he once um, he wrote an article about the Rebbe, and he surmised that um, the, the Rebbe's life's mission, he explained, was uh, in the context of, of the Second World War, the world from which the Rebbe uh, came. The Rebbe narrowly escaped uh, the Nazis. And um, survived the war. Uh, millions of Jews didn't survive. The whole Jewish world was uh, was uh, devastated and um, not only annihilated. It was annihilation. And um, the question is, how do you how do you uh, heal from such a profound black hole, a profound uh, devastation like that. So while the Nazis, may their names be erased, uh, hunted down Jews uh, in hate to kill and annihilate them, the Rebbe uh, went the other extreme, to reach out to Jews and to people at large, in the larger community, in love and acceptance. And in that way, the Rebbe, uh, you know, built from the ashes of World War II and uh, the Jewish world and Jewish life today uh, is thriving, perhaps more than ever in our history, uh, all throughout the world. And in large part, it's due to, to people like the Rebbe, the leadership of the Rebbe, that uh, was really a global reach wasn't just a rabbi of a congregation or of a community, but it was a, a rabbi had a global vision for the world. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I, I, I was telling you before, I do think about that, especially in the context of Passover, which is a celebration of freedom and being, um, you know, liberated from bondage in, uh, in Egypt. <clears throat> but, you know, we're, we're, we're still working through the Holocaust. We're, we're not done thinking about it. It still leaves scars. The, the wounds are so profoundly deep that neither we nor our children's children's children children will ever forget what happened. <clears throat> and what is um, really chilling is that there are people who deny the Holocaust, an incredible anti-Semitic statement to make, um, and there are people who are reliving um, anti-Semitism now so just as, uh, as you say, Judaism is thriving in its own way around the world, um, so is uh, anti-Semitism expanding around the world, especially in this country and also in Europe. And I just uh, wonder what Rabbi Schneerson would say about that, were he alive today. Well, the Rebbe would say, I think, as he said on many occasions, that uh, in the Zohar, there's a, there's a saying in the Zohar, which is the main book of Jewish mysticism. And over there it says, uh, translated in English would be, a little light dispels a lot of darkness. That the only way to rid the world of the darkness of hatred and anti-Semitism and all of these uh, issues is only through a positive, positive education, through light. 
by example, by teachings, and um, anti-Semitism specifically is, you know, has been around forever, unfortunately. In the times of the first Jew, Abraham, you read how he uh, was uh, thrown into a pit of fire for his beliefs, his beliefs of monotheism, that there is a one God who uh, lords over the world. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought. Well, I, you know, I think it, it's really um, an expanded view of the view that he expressed while he was alive. Right. It's the view of his, his followers like you, right. uh, who have, have incorporated his, his system, his, his beliefs into your life. And uh, that's, that's worthy. I, and I just hope I'm outside that world, although I identify as Jewish. Right. Um, and I just hope You're not that outside. that's a solution <laughs> going forward because there's dynamic here. It isn't, it isn't static. There's dynamic. Right. You know, we say, you know, on, on Passover night, we read the Haggadah. The Haggadah tells the story of our exodus from Egypt uh, and that which our rabbis added and which we say it at the Seder table. The Seder uh, in Hebrew is the word for order because there's an order, there's a definite order to the whole evening. Uh, but there's one passage there which is very, very uh, apropos to what you're saying, and it's also very chilling, and that is that in every generation, they rise up to, uh, to hurt us, and to kill us, and it, is, um, and it is only but for God's protection that we, that we have survived. So, you know, that, that's true, Rabbi. And, I mean, I've been going to Seder's for, mm, oh gosh, more than 60 years, you know, pretty much every year. And um, that language is there every year in the Haggadah, right in the middle of the Haggadah, and, uh, in every generation. The paragraph begins in every generation. And the people who would annihilate the Jews rise. <clears throat> and, you know, after a while, it gets to be part of your thinking. But you don't see it, uh, you know, as, uh, as a new statement. It's an old statement. It's a statement that's been going on for a long time, since Egypt. And um, I, think, I think we have to read the Haggadah fresh every year. We can't let it be an old statement. We have to make it relevant today. Exactly. You know, there are many um, versions of the Haggadah, uh, printed in many, well, in every language you can think of. Um, and uh, it, it always rotates between uh, Hebrew on the, what, the right side of the page and the other language, English, say, on the left side of the page. Um, and people read it in, uh, in alternating verse, you know, the, around the table, which is always a way to invest people in exactly what it is saying. <clears throat> but what I like most about it is the commentary. Depending on the version you look at, the commentary that makes it relevant today Certainly, there's a lot of commentary about the Holocaust and World War II in, in, in any edition of the Haggadah, because it, is, it runs a parallel track to what happened in Egypt, uh, or worse. Um, but I think it's also relevant to what's happening right now. And I don't think the Haggadah should be carved in stone. The right. prayers, right. you know, the Hebrew, the songs, the rituals, yes. But the references uh, have to be... Very, very relevant, relevant every year. very relevant and contemporary, and you're right. And yeah. actually, that's the, that's the main purpose of the whole tradition, not just to uh, recall what happened in the past, but by so doing, to reflect on the present and build towards a better future. And that's really um, that's the, the optimism that comes out of reading the Haggadah, that we were in a bind, he tried to kill us. God saved us. We're here. We give thanks to God. And we uh, continue. And that's the story of the Jewish people, the survival of the Jewish people. Yeah, the story in Egypt is, uh, I don't know, I think it's a special story, but it resonates with all the other stories <laughs> that you hear about somebody rising up and trying to kill the Jews. And the one in Egypt is maybe best remembered in the sense that it's, it's repeated every year. 
It's sure. part of the, the sure. ritual. It's part of the national memory of the Jewish nation. Yeah. And, and, and you go through it. You yeah. actually go through it. Uh, yeah. The Haggadah is a very rich statement of that story and the prayers that go with that story, and the lessons that come out of that story, and the engagement of everybody at the table, no matter what age uh, or inclination, uh, about that story. It's an attempt to bring uh, everybody at the table together and remember it. Right. And um, what's remarkable is we see it at the Seder night, the Seder table, but it's also true in every other Jewish tradition, is the is the um, inspiration and the optimism. You know, we talk about difficult times and our uh, and difficult history, but it's not a somber, sad gathering uh, of people. It's festive. Although there were very serious, somber moments. You know, I remember Anima, I mean, yeah. you know that song about, yeah. uh, I believe you know, we still state. believe, yes. walking to the gas chamber, we right. still believe. Um, that's there. But that, yeah, I agree with you, that, it, it, that doesn't dominate the Seder. It's right. just a point, point of reference. <clears throat> what dominates the Seder in, ter in terms of the liturgy is uplifting. The songs are happy. They're fun. They're memorable. They're good music. <laughs> they're creative lyrics, all it, that. It, it's the rebirth, really, that's emphasized, yeah. the Renaissance. Yeah. And, uh, and that's true about Judaism in general, even though the, we have in our history so much suffering there is, you're mentioning about the many different Haggadahs. I, I saw a Haggadah once, that's the, uh, the book from which you read. Uh, in Hebrew, Haggadah means to tell the story. This, you know, the, this whole narrative tells the story. And this particular Haggadah had a, a fold-out of about 10 pages that went through the different Hagrams that the Jewish people suffered in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. This is even before the Holocaust. It's like this date, this year, this community, this date, pages and pages long of what our ancestors uh, suffered. So Judaism, our history is one of a long suffering, but we don't, um, we don't elevate suffering, uh, you know, and make it, you know, something special and holy. On the contrary, we're a loving, you know, we love joy and happiness, and that's the emphasis in, in Judaism. And it's, you think about it, it's very remarkable how, how um, we Jews are able to uh, keep our heads held high and joyous and happy in spite of all the history. Mm -hmm. That somehow is a commentary on Jewish humor. Yeah, also. <laughs> when, when you right. have tragedy, then true. humor has a place. True, 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 yeah. true. true. Yeah. But I also want to mention <clears throat> here in Hawaii, Chabad uh, will be having, like you mentioned before, public seders where everyone is uh, invited and welcome. They can call our office, which is 808-735-8161, or go online, ChabadofHawaii.com. And we not only have seders here in Honolulu, we also have on all the outer islands as well. There's Chabad houses, Chabad rabbis on the outer islands, the Big Island, Kauai, and Maui. They'll be having public seders as well. And it's a very, very uh, meaningful experience and a joyous experience. And I uh, encourage everyone who doesn't have a place to go to uh, lift up the phone and call Chabad, and you'll be happy to do I can vouch for that. I I was at your Seder last year. Um, wow, it was a lot of people came. Uh, a lot of them didn't know each other. I mean, some, some tourists, some visitors. Uh, I sat at a table with uh, a, uh, a woman who was an Israeli um, military person. She was, she was really very military. And she was really smart and focused and all that. She was a very interesting person to meet. I hadn't met anybody like that before. Um, and uh, Linda Lingle was there too last year. And uh, there were a lot of people who made friends that night. Because it's a coming together, it's a family kind of thing. And at your table, you, you tend to meet them and um, you have some fundamental you know, familiarity with them because, because of the Seder, which always brings people together. But I, but I would like to, uh, it, was, it was very nice, very impressive, and the food was out of this world, really good. 
he's coming uh, in this year. <laughs> the Robinson has something to do with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, question though, what, what is the track of a Seder? As I recall, should recall in more detail, but I recall, you know, there's a lot of prayers. Uh, in the Chabad would be a lot of prayers in Hebrew or, or well, Yiddish. Yeah, you can say it in any language. So, you, know, yeah. uh, people, you know, we say it in Hebrew and in English. You can follow in English or in Hebrew. And it basically tells the story, but it, it tells the story not from the exile and the bondage and the slavery in Egypt, but it goes to the very beginning of our history with Abraham and, um, and then how uh, and God, when he revealed himself to Abraham and entered into a covenant with Abraham and his children, God prophesied that your children will be in a strange land. The exile was prophesied from the beginning. And this is a, very interesting in the mystical teachings of the Torah. It's explained, you know, we understand exile to be something negative, a punishment of sorts. Uh, and that's true on a certain level. But on a deeper level, uh, the exile, today what we call the diaspora, uh, is actually part of God's plan for uh, the Jewish people. And specifically, it is the means and the way to which we, the Jewish people, are able to get the message uh, to the entire world. Passover is directly related to that because, you know, we were slaves in Egypt. That was the Jewish people. That was the, you know, Israel, so to speak. Um, and when uh, we left with our unleavened bread, walk in the desert, cross the Red Sea, walk in the desert. That was the beginning of, of, of the diaspora, wasn't it? That yes. was it. That yes. was when it started. You know? Yes, yes. The first diaspora was in Egypt. That's why Passover is such a big deal. Yeah. By the way, something <clears throat> very, very fascinating. For all those that doubt the, uh, the literal truth of the Bible, uh, I was reading, and you can see it on a YouTube video, that there's some archaeologists in Egypt, actually an Egyptian archaeologist, recently made a finding uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom of the, of the sea, the Red Sea, and they found remains of many, many people with remains of what they describe as chariots, with wheels and parts of wheels. Basically, everything that, is, that we read in the Bible about the miracle, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then how the Egyptians came chasing the Jewish people and they drowned. This archaeologist claims to have found evidence that this is because the way he says the way the bones were, the remains were were found and clusters of many people together. He uh, confirms from his findings that what the Bible says has actually happened. Oh, so interesting. You know, there's an archaeologist from UH who's working on a dig right now, okay. Robert Littman I know, in, in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what strikes me, though, is this, and I don't, I don't remember if Chabad is different from other seders I've been at in this regard, but my favorite seders have been where the people at the table would make commentary. In other words, um, so you're reading a particular passage, and somebody says, you know, did you know what happened with archaeology in Egypt? How they have confirmed, you know, these, you know, these these stories in the Bible, and everybody says, "Wow," okay, and then you move on. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, I, my favorite seders have been where people had the opportunity to be that. Different seders, different strokes for different folks. You know, you know, they say, uh, you know, in a joke, that you know, God has a tremendous sense of humor because He made all archaeologists atheists. So they find there everything it says in the Bible, but they're atheists. So. <laughs> and they, then, they, then they become religious. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, and then at the end of the Seder, there's uh, so much singing. Right. And you have to drink so many glasses of wine. Four cups of wine. How many glasses? Four cups of Four wine. Four cups of wine. Yeah. And each time you, you drink a cup of wine, it's like a milestone yes. in, in the liturgy. <laughs> yes. And then at the end, your, your singing is better. Yes. But um, next year in Jerusalem, that's how we conclude. Next this. year in Jerusalem, what does that mean? Uh, tell us. You know, the, there must be you know overlays and uh, implications to that statement. What does there it mean? There is, and, and 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 this is perhaps one of the most 
uh, foundational ideas of Judaism. And that is that at the end, it's all going to work out. That uh, what's, you know, what's good and godly will triumph, and the world will be transformed you know, to its fullest potential, which is the, the messianic era, the coming of the Messiah, as the prophets prophesied. So next year in Jerusalem is that, yes, we're not there yet, but next year our hope and our faith in the redemption, and that it's at the end it's going to work out. Not that the end is doom, and gloom, as unfortunately some people feel, uh, but Judaism teaches us, no, that it's all going to work out, that good will triumph over evil, and that God will, uh, through the Messiah, will, will, will transform the whole world, and, and evil will be removed from this world. And what about the, on the face of that language, what about that language is signifying a call? Um, you know, Israel, um, you know, uh, Jerusalem as the center of Israel, at least for the Bible, and, and now for this country as well. Um, Israel is our uh, ultimate home. And uh, we've been there or aspiring to be there for, since, uh, since the... Uh, um, since we left Egypt. And, um, and so we, every year, at the end of the Seder, we remind ourselves uh, that next year, maybe next year, we'll finally get back there. It's something to aspire to. It's uh, something, it's on your bucket list. <laughs> something you need to do in this life is reconnect uh, with Jerusalem and Israel. Right, and we're talking about on the highest levels, you know, not just uh, you know, a, a flight to Israel for a week and come back. We're talking about all of the prophecies in the Bible about uh, Israel and Jerusalem and uh, all the, the, the good and the light that will come from Zion and Jerusalem. That's, yeah. what, you know, that's what the aspiration is for. Yeah. I called my brother this morning, and I said, uh, you know, can you talk? He said, no, I can't talk. I'm negotiating. I said, what are you negotiating about? He says, well, I, I, I made my search for homemates in the house. That's leavened bread. And then I put it in a bag, and I'm, I'm selling it now. Because that's, that, the tradition is you search, you find, you, you don't throw food away. You sell it. And he was in the process of negotiating a sale uh, for the leavened bread uh, to get it out of the house and do the right thing. And the house will be you know, purified, sanctified for, for Passover. Passover yeah. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, you know, I, it says, I don't do that, but I know about it. Uh, do a lot of people do that? And, and what's, what's a pound of homemade worth in the market, Rabbi? Well, first of all, yes, many Jews, uh, traditional and observe uh, the laws of Passover. Biblically, for the Jewish people on Passover, we're not allowed to eat any homemade, any leavened bread. But leavened bread is not just bread bread, cakes, and almost any product you buy in the supermarket, you know, one of some of the ingredients perhaps are uh, leavened, uh, and they would render it uh, like, like leavened bread. Not only are you not allowed to eat it, but you're not allowed to possess it, you're not allowed to own it. And henceforth, the custom is for Passover, we sell all our comrades. And interestingly, according to Jewish law, it's not just the food but also the pots and pans that have absorbed, you know, while cooking this food. So, you know, that's why in, in traditional Jewish homes there's a separate set of dishes for Passover mm -hmm. for the rest of the year. And you wash out all the shelves where the food used to be. Yeah, clean you everything. Clean yeah. everything out. I wonder, I wonder what would happen if I went down to uh, Foodland or, Safe, or Safeway with my bag of leavened bread and I, and I asked them, would, would you take this leavened bread and how much would you pay? Yeah. Hey, by, by the way, the way it's done is you, buy, you sell it to a non-Jewish person, and then you immediately buy it back after Passover. Oh, is that right? Yeah. It's a storage arrangement. <laughs> it's a real sale and a real repurchase. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I didn't know that until now, Rabbi. There's much to learn about Passover. And every time you go to a Seder, you learn more. And every time you go through the Haggadah, you learn more. And every time you look at the prayers and the recitations and the implications, Every time you sing the songs, you learn more. Right, and just one more last thought, and that is um, a central part of the whole Haggadah is the children, you know, the four sons in the, in the Haggadah. And the children are like the center of 
and the purpose of the whole Seder because the purpose of the Seder and Passover Eve is to pass it on to your children. You'll teach it to your children, pass it on to the next generation. And that's why many things are done just to arouse the interest and the curiosity of the children. I know so, there, are, uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, kid songs in the Haggadah and the, some serious songs, but the one, and the, of course the four questions stick in my mind, but for a long time, you know, I, I favored myself on singing that. Okay. And, and I, really, I really enjoyed that, even now. You're supposed to be the youngest person in the room, you know, <laughs> makes the, the four questions, but, you know, older people can do it too. <clears throat> but then, the, am I right about the holidays here? It was one only kid. Yes. Chad Gadya. Chad Gadya. So why don't we sing that, you and me together? Can we do that now? I don't have the words here, but we, we can, can just sing yeah. it. Chad Gadya, Chad Gadya. Zabin Abba Bishesus. Chad Gadya, Chad Gadya. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> wonderful to have Thank you on you, the Jay, show. Thank you, as always. Wonderful. Happy Passover. We wish everyone a happy Passover <laughs> and uh, enjoy your seders and Everyone is invited to come join us. Thank you, Rabbi.